Okay, so welcome everyone. <clears throat> I'm going to give a hasty retrospective on sandwich problems in this uh, talk, and feel free to break in and ask me questions when you like. Uh, many of you are very familiar with this problem, and others are perhaps less. ¿Qué cosa ahora? Yes. Sí. And I'm going to ask everyone to mute themselves. So let's begin. Uh, graph sandwich problems are all about guessing and filling in missing edges in the graph, dealing with partial information, missing data, and deducing consistency when you are trying to fill in missing edges according to certain criteria. So for example, suppose you're thinking of a mystery chordal graph. Now you'll remember that a chordal graph is one where every cycle of length greater than or equal to four has a chord. And that's a property of a graph that is very, very familiar to most of you. Uh, on the left, we have a graph that's not chordal because here you can see a cycle of length four which does not have a chord, a, an edge that connects, uh, that would break up this cycle. And on the right, you have a graph that is chordal. There are no uh, holes or cordless cycles in this graph. So now let's uh, suppose I tell my daughter to set <clears throat> and I give her a set of edges that are mandatory to be in my graph G, and another set of edges that are optional that she might add or might not add one by one. Can she find a chordal graph by filling in some of those op optional edges? We assume your daughter is very clever. So here's an example. G1 is not chordal. You can see that cordless cycle of length five here. And G2, which has extra edges, the red ones that are optional to be added, is also not chordal. You can see a C5, a five cycle in that graph. What I would like her to do is to pick a subset of the red edges, the, of the optional ones, fill them in in order to get a chordal graph. In this example, we see in the middle that by adding these, uh, these edges, but not all of them, we've created a chordal graph and we call that the chordal sandwich graph for this problem. So we're given G1 required edges, G2 the required and some optional, and we select among the optional to fill it in for uh, the property we're looking at. In real life, there are often cases where we have incomplete data, missing data, information that we uh, would like to uh, complete. There's some things we know to be true. They are the edges, let's say, that we know to must be there. Others that we know are false that cannot be there. And in the middle ground, we have don't knows, don't cares. We choose values for those for that unknown middle and expect our world somehow to be consistent. And sandwich problems study filling in unknown missing data, uh, deducing consistency in some logical manner. Let's take our uh, favorite property of a graph called, called pi. The pi graph sandwich problem, as many of you know, you're given a set of vertices V, a mandatory set E1, a larger set E2 that contains E1. And we ask, is there a sandwich graph G whose edge set is between, sandwiched between E1 and E2 that satisfies the property we're looking for, P uh, uh, pi? The optional edges are E1 minus E, E2 minus E1. And the forbidden edges are all possible edges, 
minus E2. If E2 is equal to E1, there's nothing optional, then that's just the recognition problem. So here is an example of a pie sandwich and another ice cream pie sandwich. Let's look at this uh, problem called the diamond-free uh, sandwich problem. I'm going to stop the share and silence the person who's uh, not muted. If I can find them on the list. You can just click mute all. Yeah, it, it is muted now. Oh, it's all muted. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so a diamond is the graph that we see here with one edge missing. And if I'm looking for a uh, graph that is diamond free, has no diamond, then I'm going to be forced to add that edge in order to break up that diamond. So that would be forced to be added. So it's very simple to have an algorithm for diamond-free sandwich. Check for every diamond, whether E is among the optional edges. If it's optional, you're forced to add it to it. And if it's not there, then you'll fail. You won't be able to break that diamond. Adding forced edges may create new diamonds you continue this until there's uh, either no more diamonds or you failed. Now the early reference on scrap sandwich problems are three papers. The first paper uh, is actually the one in the middle. This is a <clears throat> paper about computational biology. And although it's not stated there, it shows that the chordal graph problem for sandwich is NP complete. Ron Shamir and I proved that for interval graphs, it's NP complete. And then we had a larger study together with Chaim Kaplan, where we looked at a lot of different classes of graphs. Permutation graphs, comparability graphs, circle graphs were all NP complete for the sandwich problem. Split graph, threshold, and co graphs were polynomial. And these three papers are each cited about 250 times. So it tells you uh, about how big the community of sandwich graph researchers is people writing papers from all sorts of uh, institutions. From our 1995 paper, we had this drawing with uh, quite a number of glass graph classes. Uh, the classes that uh, are in thin circles were polynomial. In thick were known to be NP complete. The dotted ones at that time, like strongly chordal, were uh, open at that time. Since then, it's been uh, strongly chordal and others have been settled. And trapezoid graphs, which wasn't in our drawing, drawing uh, wasn't here. But I'd like to tell you about them. So trapezoid graphs, as some of you uh, will know very well, are the intersection graphs of trapezoids on a channel. So if you look at this diagram, you can see there are a bunch of trapezoids. We create their intersection graph, and that will be a trapezoid graph. And a graph will be trapezoid graph if it has such a representation. So first of all, the recognition problem for trapezoid graphs is polynomial. The first algorithm was by Ma and Spinrad, and then an improved one by Langley. Now the sandwich problem here is NP complete, but you won't find this in the journal literature. 
And the reduction to show this uses the betweenness problem. And it's similar to the proof for NP completeness of sandwich for permutation, for co-comparability, and for unit interval graphs that we uh, showed in uh, our original paper. So I'd like to, as an example, especially for uh, the more uh, junior uh, novice researchers among you, uh, I'll give you an idea of this, uh, pro uh, this problem and how we can easily show that trapezoid sandwich is NP complete. So we do a reduction from the betweenness problem, which is the following. The input is a set of elements, A1 through AN, and a collection of triplets, T1 through TM, of distinct elements of S, where the, each triplet consists of three elements from S, and the one in the, in the middle is distinguished. That's why I've colored it green. And the question is, does there exist an ordering of S, a kind of one-to-one -one function, from S to the numbers one through N, such that for each triplet, for I equals one through M, either the order in which they appear in my ordering F is the first, the second, the second, then the third, or the third, the second, and the first. So that that distinguished element in the middle is always has to be in the middle. So I've rearranged the items into an order, and for every triplet, this has to be satisfied. This is a long known NP concrete problem since 1979. And it's a useful technique for exploiting uh, the unique way that a P5 uh, will, will be represented in these classes of graphs. And I'll illustrate that uh, for trapezoids. So the reduction from betweenness to trapezoid sandwich goes like this. Uh, I want to have, I have a betweenness uh, problem. I want to create a trapezoid sandwich problem that will reflect it. So I'm building that trapezoid sandwich problem as follows. The vertices will be my elements of S, A1 through AN, union with pairs of new vertices, two for each triplet, UJ and WJ for every triplet. And the edges will be as follows. The mandatory edges will be this cordless path. So I have uh, for the triplet A, I1, I2, I3, I'll have those three elements being given in the order in which they occur in the triplet. And between them, I have my auxiliary vertices UI, sorry, UJ and WJ for that triplet. My forbidden edges will be the ones that are basically missing here. That is between the U's and the others, and here they are illustrated. So these are the edges that are forbidden. Now this gadget is repeated for each of the triples and all other edges in my sandwich problem are optional, those connecting the, be, that would go between gadgets. Now remember, when I'm looking at a particular element, say AI1, this is one of the elements in I, and it will participate in several triplets. So you can imagine that the gadgets are glued together on their A's, and the edges that are not uh, either black or forbidden in red will be optional. And a key observation in connecting betweenness with trapezoid is the illustrated here. Uh, in any trapezoid representation of a cordless five path, it must appear as follows. The trapezoids for my elements of S, T, AI1, 
AI2, AI3 will have to be disjoint. And since they are disjoint, one of them, namely the distinguished guy, will have to be in the middle. So the order of them will have to be either this way or its mirror image in order to realize the P4, the P5. And the auxiliary guys will have to connect the first two and the last two. And so this is forced by the gadget. And that's what uh, allows us to be able to say that if we have an ordering of S, which satisfies the betweenness, it will give a trapezoid realization just following this formula. And conversely, if we had a trapezoid real, uh, realization, it would force the trapezoids uh, corresponding to S to be linearly ordered, and that will be our solution. So this is a proof that uh, trapezoid sandwich is NP complete, and it's modeled exactly after the same proof for interval graphs, for permutation graphs, for co-comparability graphs, and perhaps for others that have, can be lined up uh, in this linear fashion. Now I'll ask you, uh, what is your favorite pi? Well, being a tree is a very nice graph property. The tree sandwich problem is linear. Caterpillars is a nice property to have. That is a graph that is a path with pendant edges stuck, sticking out of it. The caterpillar sandwich problem is NP complete. And planar graphs, well, that's very easy. The planar graph sandwich is simply checking whether the mandatory edges G1 form a planar graph, recognizing that because adding edges will only make it worse. Now, I'll tell you a little story about how I got interested in graph sandwich problems. It was through my work on temporal reasoning in artificial intelligence back in 1989-90. Intervals, of course, time intervals interact with each other and People in AI are interested in uh, working with uh, temporal events. Some of you have heard me give a talk on temporal reasoning and interval graphs. We'll notice this slide and how temporal reasoning is a very old science, but it's not really as old as the dinosaurs, but of the paleontologist thinking about the bones that he's seeing and how to put them together. And in the same way, if I have information about time events, I would like to put them together on some sort of a timeline. These events on the timeline may be given to me with some information like uh, one event is before or after another or during, but many of them may be unknown to us because in the story about these events, much is left out. So if I were just to say that uh, dinosaur S emerged before dinosaur T and perished, not after it, there are four different consistent scenarios for when their time intervals of existence might be. And that's illustrated on this slide. It might be that S really was before T, then there was a gap, and then T emerged and perished. Or it might be that there have been some event that caused S to disappear and T to emerge, and or they might have overlapped in different ways. And finding a consistent placement of these time events is an example of sandwich problem. And we do that by the temporal clues that were given by the partial information. So during my sabbatical that year, Ron Shamir, who was also on sabbatical, uh, had some discussions with me. And I found that uh, he was interested in the same idea coming from computational biology, where in that case, the structure of genes that are arranged 
in a linear fashion along a string of DNA, also had partial information. You were trying to reconstruct the gene and how those linear segments would combine. And in these applications, you almost never have complete data, but you try to cope with as much data as you have and use consistency to extrapolate other possible uh, relationships and scenarios that are consistent with what you have. And our work evolved into a larger study of reasoning about time. So in temporal reasoning, we do not know necessarily the precise relationship between intervals. And each in pair of intervals, Ix and Iy, could be any disjunction of these three basic relations. That is, I might really know that x is before y, or that x is after i, or that they intersect. But I might only be told that x is either less than or intersects, or intersects or greater than. Or it might be back out here that I don't know what it is. The relationship between x and y might be less than, it might be intersect, it might be greater than, and I don't really know. And that led us to the interval graph sandwich problem, where I'm restricting my relations to only three of these seven disjunctions. That is, I'm told that two intervals intersect, or I'm told that they are disjoint, or I'm told that it's optional. This is an example of a fragment of the whole satisfiability problem with all possible uh, disjunctions, all seven of them. And so we asked ourselves, what uh, is the complexity of solving these satisfiability problems? And as I said, the first example was this, where we're only talking about this fragment, which are exactly the cases of the inter interval sandwich problem. And that the satisfiability problem is NP complete for that. It's also in uh, NP complete if my input were restricted to just these three disjunctions, meaning the intervals are disjoint, uh, the relationship is intersect greater than or intersect less than. And Weber proved that to be NP complete. But some of those fragments are tractable. For example, if I do not allow disjointness among those intervals, and I only of these six possible dis, disjunctions, then it's linear. And if I, instead I chose this set of disjunctions, this is equivalent to the interval order sandwich problem, and that uh, is also linear. And the last case for our maximal tractable fragments was an n cubed algorithm when we are given just uh, the relationship that definitely less than y, x is definitely greater than, they definitely intersect, or they definitely are disjoint. And this is the interval graph recognition problem, which of course we know to be a uh, polynomial. And you can even lower this ex exponent as most of you know. But why are these fragments so important? Well, the advantage of some tractable fragments is that if you're trying to solve a big satisfiability problem on intervals, it's useful to be able to focus on some of the subproblems that can be solved. So I test partial solutions using algorithms that are efficient, and it will guide my generating. Uh, choices in a, some kind of global search and help me cut down a, a big search into smaller uh, pieces. It will allow me to perhaps order my variables wisely as in uh, any kind of constraint satisfiability problem. 
if I uh, to, when I get to the stage when I have to do some sort of uh, uh, brute force or guided heuristic search. So we've talked about uh, the trapezoid sandwich problem, and I'd like to in the interval sandwich problem. I'd like to talk about threshold pro, uh, sandwich threshold graphs as most of you know, is a very important family of graph. They were introduced by Schwatal and Hammer. Two, two of Peter's students, Uri Pellet and uh, NVR Mahadev wrote the book on threshold graphs and related topics. Uh, the definition of a threshold graph is given here. It's a graph for which you can assign positive weights to the inter to the vertices and a th positive threshold so that a subset of vertices is a stable set and inter independent set if the sum of their weights is less than or equal to the threshold. Now, if you look at the history of certain books, Berge, when he wrote Graphs and Hypergraphs, had one chapter on perfect graphs about 25 pages. When I wrote my book on algorithmic graph theory and perfect graphs, I expanded it into uh, many, each of his sections and others expanded into the whole book. And I had one chapter on threshold graphs. And what Mahadev and Pele did was expand on threshold graphs to give all sorts of other new developments that happened over 15 years to create their book. The threshold graph theorem that many of you know gives several characterizations of threshold graphs. G is a threshold graph. If its complement is a threshold graph, if there exists positive weights uh, on the vertices and a different threshold to distinguish between edges where the weights of the endpoints of the edges have to be greater than the, this other threshold. A, an algorithmic characterization where you repeatedly, repeatedly remove a universal or isolated vertex, eventually getting the empty set, and a forbidden subgraph characterization. This will be familiar with uh, to most of you. I want to focus on this characterization here where you can simply re re remove a universal or isolated vertex. This is what a threshold gra graph looks like in its structure. One side is a clique. One side has to be an independent or stable set. The neighborhoods are nested. You see that uh, if this is a threshold graph, you'll have isolates. When you remove them, this top vertex will become universal, meaning he's adjacent to everyone else. When you remove him, this vertex becomes isolated and they go back and forth until I'm able to eliminate everything. How do I use this idea for the sandwich problem? Well, if I'm given a sandwich problem, it's quite simple. These are my mandatory edges. These are my optional edges. And the greedy algorithm will do it. Remove the isolated vertices of G1. Remove ver universal vertices from G2 and record which edges I've added. Repeat this over and over until either you fail there is no isolate or universal in what is left and in this elimination process. Or I've succeeded, in which case adding the edges F to the mandatory will give me a sandwich solution. Well, for a long time, no one had really looked at uh, the sandwich problem for chain graphs until I was in Brazil. And Selena and Simone and Sulamita and I and Frederic 
looked at uh, the chain graph sandwich problem. So a chain graph is a bipartite graph that has no 2K2 subgraph. So we call them 2K2 free bipartite graphs. This is a 2K2, this is forbidden. And we knew quite a bit about chain graphs. Well, for one thing, the definition being 2K2 free, our characterization is that the X set of the bipartite graph can be ordered so that neighborhoods are nested. The same can be done for the Y side. Every induced subgraph has at most one non-singleton component and has a universal vertex, an X, or a universal Y vertex. That is an X that's adjacent to all the Y vertices or a Y vertex adjacent to all of the X vertices. And also has a, weight, a weighted uh, uh, characterization where you can assign weights and a threshold. So this should remind you a lot of the theorem for threshold graphs. And so in your mind, you're thinking, well, chain graphs are probably just uh, like threshold graphs. And in most cases, they are. They have the same kind of structure the nested neighborhood. And so it might have been uh, obvious that if threshold thre sandwich could be solved easily, so could chain. But to my surprise, that wasn't the case. And we'll see why. The chain graph sandwich problem, in fact, is NP complete. And that was in contrast to the following cases. When E1, the mandatory, is a connected graph, well, indeed, it's exactly like threshold. Because you can take a chain graph, fill in one side of the bipartition of this bipartite graph, and you'll have a threshold graph, and vice versa. Take a threshold graph, erase the clique edges, and you'll get a chain graph. But it's the fact that chain graph, the connectivity, causes a difference in the complexity. So the chain bow and the chain uh, threshold sandwich was linear and one and two was the obvious uh, deduction. Also the chain probe graph problem, which we'll mention a little bit later was known to be polynomial. So why is chain sandwich so different from threshold sandwich? Well, as I pretty much explained, it's because uh, in, chain graph, in the chain graph sandwich, you may have mandatory edges that give you components, separate components, which somehow have to be combined. Because if you have a, a non-trivial component here and here, you're going to have to add an, an optional edge between them so as to break this 2K2. And whether you do it this way or this way, that is, if this edge becomes X, Y, or X, Y, is a binary choice. If you have a lot of those choices, it pumps it up to being exponential. And so that's the main difference between graph sandwich uh, for threshold and chain. Now, there are other sandwich problems that people looked at. Hypergraph sandwich problems, Boolean function completion problems, pulset sandwich problems, peanut butter sandwich problems. And now I'll just pause to tell you a little story. When I was giving a uh, talk, uh, preparing a talk for a conference in Florida on sandwich problems, I was on the subway in New York going to Rutgers. And I picked up a newspaper and I saw an advertisement for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Yes, there is a place called the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And there you have different creations of peanut butter sandwiches that are very artistic. And this, they were going to have an open house free to the public at the Peanut Butter and, Co and Company store, which exists in 
lower Manhattan. And they <clears throat> invited people to come to this public event. So of course, if I'm taking the subway and thinking of sandwiches, how could I not go there the following Sunday? So I took my granddaughter and we visited there and there's some of the uh, artistic works that you can find in, <clears throat> at the peanut butter company. Well, <clears throat> if in 1995, uh, we had about 25 families where we knew the complexity, that hierarchy has grown and grown. And here I have a table with many of our favorite graph classes that were studied subsequent to the paper by Ron and Chaim and myself. So the very first line tolerance graph sandwich, I think is still an open question. I don't believe, I, I, uh, I be I'm sure it has to be NP complete, but I haven't seen a proof of that but maybe some of you have. Trapezoid grass, we just looked at. And although uh, uh, it wasn't in any paper, in the book by uh, Anne Trank and, and myself on tolerance graphs, we have a section of sandwich uh, problems. The interval sandwich problem is proven there. And an exercise is given to prove trapezoid graph using the same technique that I just showed you. Well, in 07, strongly chordal was finally broken as NP complete. Same time, chordal bipartite, a year later. Uh, K trees, K trees with fixed K, unit interval graphs, unit interval graphs with bounded clique size, C whole free graphs. A few others, and as you can see, uh, the list of references just goes on. Many of my friends from uh, Brazil who are even on this uh, Zoom are authors of some of these papers. And here is a very recent paper that uh, just appeared last year by Jose, Simone, and Dieter. Sandwiches missing two ingredients of order four. What are those ingredients? Meaning you forbid two different small graphs and you determine their complexity. And they have a list of every possible combination that you could imagine of these small graphs. So you have a whole long list of polynomial solvable graphs, and the other list of NP-complete. So maybe I will uh, stop share right now and ask Simone, do you have any comments about that paper? Yes. Um, it's a, it, it was a, a challenge work proposed by you it was it was a very interesting um, uh, subject and we have few uh, we have we have uh, it's not a few but a lot of uh, open problems that we left uh, there I can I can cite the 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 um, I think that the, the challenge ones uh, are with cont contain uh, contains um, contains a claw in as one of the, the 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 graphs. I mean the 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 pair of graphs. So uh, the paper has those challenge problems in it at uh, at the very end. Yes, I perhaps I can I I can I can sh share uh, a nice 
Sure, I... go ahead. Um, I don't know how to share, but okay. <laughs> um, Are you, are you? We, we see you, we don't see your share yet. Oh, I, I, oh, uh, it's not, I think I, I, will, I have to, to, to leave the meeting to, you know, and come back. Okay, so oh, in that, so yeah. in that case, we'll, we'll wait till uh, uh, people read the paper. Yeah, I guess. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yes. Okay. And, I think uh, it's, yes. I think that's uh, okay. yeah. It's it's more it's easier. Sorry. Okay. Very good. Okay. So I'll go back to uh, uh, where I where I was. Uh, so if that previous table was uh, not big enough for you, uh, so here is a little bit more, uh, a larger a continuation of that uh, list. Cali caterpillars, cleat cut sets, line graphs with lots of uh, papers that uh, can be read. And I'd like to point out one line here called the homogeneous set problem, which is polynomial. Now the homogeneous sandwich problem uh, was studied in Brazil. And uh, the first paper in 1998 had an algorithm of n to the fourth that was slightly improved later on to uh, lower it by one, by one uh, order of magnitude, adding in a log. Then Durand and Habib uh, studied a uh, maximization variation of the sandwich problem uh, and showed that uh, that problem was NP complete. So here it was just the, the straight homogeneous sandwich problem, but if you add a maximization criteria, then it uh, blows, to, blows up to be NP complete. And uh, it cannot even be approximated to uh, a factor of one minus epsilon. Well, here's a paper by Michel on the complexity issues of the sandwich homogeneous problem. And uh, you might ask, what's he looking at? Well, a sandwich, of course. Now, I won't go into the homogeneous set problem in, in, uh, uh, in depth. Just uh, put it up here. On the uh, on the slide, because I'd like to go on to a few other problems. One of them is the matrix view of sandwiches. So you can think of the adjacency matrix of a graph as being a zero one matrix, and if I add uh, missing edges or edge sorry edges where they are unknown or optional. That means that I have a adjacency matrix with entries zero, one, and star, where star means I don't care whether you put a one or a zero in that spot, just fill them in to give me my desired property. One of the early results was that the consecutive ones matrix sandwich problem and the circular ones matrix sandwich problem are NP complete. So we understand this as consecutive ones prob property is a matrix problem you're familiar with. Can my rows columns be 
prearranged so that in every row, the ones occur consecutively. A second problem is the Ferrer's matrix sandwich problem. And that uh, could be solved in M times N time for an M by N matrix. Well, then I asked uh, about a matrix property where you can rearrange the matrix so that the ones occur in blocks, a rectangular block pattern. And very often you have problems like that occurring or a structure like that in matrices in uh, numerical analysis. And so I asked the sandwich problem. If you're given a matrix of one zeros and stars, can you fill in some of the stars with ones in order to get this pattern? And the theorem was that the rectangular block decomposition sandwich problem can be solved in time uh, linear in the size of the matrix. But if you require that the matrix be, uh, that the blocks inside the matrix be squares and not rectangles as they're illustrated here, then the problem is NP complete. I'd like to connect this idea of sandwiches with uh, another problem, which has uh, a sub problem of sandwich actually, called the partition probe graph problem. And here the problem is well illustrated on a, on a matrix. I have uh, the vertices partitioned into two parts. P and N. So I have my P vertices and my N vertices. And in the sub square where uh, I have, have entries that will be only zero and one, similarly in this portion and this portion, meaning I have no don't cares here. I know exactly what the edges are between P and another P, P and N. But what I don't know is this box here. Between N and N, <coughs> everything is optional. So I'm asking to fill in the missing ed uh, edges, which are only in this block of the missing zeros, uh, missing ones. <laughs> so let's play a little game called the interval graph probe game. I choose a subset of vertices N. Uh, I take the adjacency, the uh, adjacency matrix. I erase all of the entries in the sub square N by N. And now I have a probe problem. I know what the solution is because I started with an interval graph, but this is all of the information I gave you. And I give this problem to my, your students and I ask, can you fill in this, some ones in this block so that my whole matrix will be the adjacency matrix of a sandwich, uh, of a, an interval graph. So I can think of this N by N as a hole in the sandwich that has to be filled completed. So this uh, in partitioned interval probe problem, that is, I'm given a partition of the vertices into probes and non-probes. I'm given all of the edges between probes and non-probes and probes and probes, but between Pairs of non-probes, nothing is given. And I asked this question to Julie Johnson and Jerry Spinrad one time when I was visiting Jerry and Vanderbilt. 
And within 24 hours, they came up with a polynomial time algorithm to solve it. Which just goes to show that if you ask the right person the question, they'll be able to solve it. A year later, Ross McConnell and Jerry created, had a, a better, faster algorithm. And Ross, then together with Yahav Nussbaum, have uh, the best uh, algorithm so far on interval probe when you're given the partition. So it's natural for me to ask, what about the partition chordal probe problem? That is the same problem, except what I'm asking is to fill in the missing edges in n by n so that my graph will be chordal. And Anne Barry joined Marina Lipstein and myself to answer that question. The same question for unit probe was uh, solved by Yahav and two characterizations for chain probe were given by uh, Bang Lee. So altogether for the chain graph probe questions, the sandwich problem was NP complete. The non-partition version of probe is N squared. The partition probe is, prob pro is polynomial and chain graph recognition of course is linear. Okay. So uh, I guess you uh, don't have any uh, questions, otherwise you would be uh, interrupting me. So I'll continue. So once upon a time, I was visiting Michel Habib in Montpellier at that time. And I was telling him about the sandwich problem for graphs. And I said, there must be a version for posets. And since you love posets, no doubt you'll be able to uh, find some interesting things to ask and answer for poset sandwich problems. And sure enough, he took the challenge and uh, worked on it for a couple of years with colleagues and they gave some uh, results on poset sandwich problems. Along the same lines, uh, <clears throat> They asked uh, the, the, uh, the following question, which is the title of this paper, can transitive orientation make sandwich problems easier? Since if they were talking about POSET sandwich problems, POSET has a natural transitive orientation of its comparability graph. So if you know something about the transitive orientation, can that help you when you're making uh, trying to solve sandwich problems. And here is what uh, uh, they found. First of all, back in 95, we had already showed that the comparability graph sandwich problem is NP complete. And that, as you well know, is you're given uh, the mandatory edges, a superset, with optional edges. Is there a transitively orientable graph, a comparability graph that is sandwiched between them? And that we know to be NP complete from 1995. But if you are looking at digraphs and posets, the situation is a little bit different. The transitive digraph sandwich problem is given as follows. You're given a directed graph with mandatory arcs and a super set, a super graph of it. So your arcs of F1 are embedded as a subset of F2. And you want to know, is there a transitive digraph that is sandwiched between them? So it's the same question. And it turns out that this problem is actually very easy to solve. 
all you have to do is check that the transitive closure of F is contained in F2. So the interesting post-set sandwich problems to be studied were having special properties on the, on the sandwich F. That is, it can't just be an arbitrary transitive orientation. We'll put extra properties on it and ask a bunch of questions. For example, the interval order sandwich problem, which we already said or earlier in this lecture that is polynomial. But you could ask for a dimension two poset sandwich problem. That is the digraph sandwich problem where you're looking for a sandwich that is a dimension two poset. That's like what you have with permutation graphs. You could ask for the series parallel poset sandwich problem or a semi-order sandwich problem or lattice sandwich problem, not lettuce, lattice. Moreover, there are two versions of the poset sandwich problem, depending on whether your input is a digraph or a poset. So here is the version for a poset property. Let pi be a poset property. The digraph sandwich problem for a poset property is given your mandatory arcs and your uh, and your larger set with the optional arcs does there exist a poset sandwiched between them satisfying the poset problem by or you can ask the poset sandwich problem for a poset problem property and here the difference is that the input are two posets now, what, what's the difference here? The difference is, in the first case, I've given you the orientations of the edges in, in a very a more specific way than in the second. And here is what they found. They found a whole bunch of dichotomies. They found that, uh, polynomial versions for uh, co-graph sandwich problem. This we knew was to be polynomial. Here you have the graph, this graph problem. All the, all the problems on the top layer are graph. The ones on the medium one are for the directed sandwich problem. And the ones at the bottom are for the poset sandwich problem. So we have sort of three levels of problems, graph sandwich, digraph sandwich, and poset sandwich. And as you can see, if you're talking about uh, cosets, which corresponded to series parallel, everything was polynomial. If you go, let's say here, where uh, you're looking for interval graph, interval order, here you find polynomial here, but the graph problem is NP complete. Here you see that these two are, are hard and only the bottom one. And in the last column, everything was hard. So I guess to conclude my talk, I just would like to say that sandwich problems are the source of many interesting algorithmic and combinatorial questions. They're motivated naturally by a number of applications that are worthy of further research. And so I'd like to thank you on this nice winter day. Even though here in Haifa, we're 30 degrees Celsius and swimming. But this picture was taken more or less at the time when I was uh, at the peanut butter and jelly company uh, in New York. Thank you, Marty. Okay, so thank you, everyone. Thank you. I, I may thank I, you. Can I can I pose a question? 
yes, okay. but before I do that, I see that George asked uh, about the uh, recording. I will uh, be sending an email with the link to the recording, uh, like I do very often, uh, <clears throat> probably within the next 24 hours, as soon as Zoom sends it to me. So uh, yes, go ahead, Simone. Or, it's only because I, I for, sorry, I forgot the 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 proof of caterpillars, and I was I was wondering uh, what is the the problem the problem that the of the uh, this proof or, and I don't know if I the NP complete. Do you remember the NP complete problem that? The, the NP complete. Pro the, sorry, yes. the NP complete problem for, for which, the, which? For for the proof of caterpillars are NP complete. Uh, it's, sorry, I'm missing the 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 one one important word. The NP complete of, of which problem? Uh, you mentioned that the proof of uh, caterpillars. Oh, caterpillars. Yes, caterpillars. Caterpillars. yes. 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 Um, no, I don't remember offhand. I remember seeing a paper on it. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Weren't you an weren't you an author of it? No, no. I guess not. No, no, no. But uh, yes, I would like to to see which prop. Yes. Thank you for citing. I forgot to to thank you for citing our papers. Thank you very much. It was okay. a, a very nice subject of work, and I and we thank you for the okay. suggestion. Okay, so if you if you remember to send me email, I'll send you the reference for for caterpillar. But but it should also be in the slide. Okay, Flavia, you're looking great. I think that you sort of look like uh, uh, you are coming from the moon. I, I am on the streets. I'm, oh, I'm yeah. waiting for my kid. He's in the phonoaudiologist. Okay, so you know, I was so I have one of the, uh, from the car and from the street. <laughs> I, I have one and of those shields the, also. I, you wear the mask and then the shield over it. Yes, but, okay, and and, the and, uh, <laughs> and with the sunglasses, you have they you you won't yeah. be identified by <laughs> even of the most smart uh, <clears throat> uh, face recognition uh, <laughs> algorithm that artificial <laughs> intelligence can provide <laughs> you put on a hat you put on sunglasses yes. you put on a mask and uh it's just you, you just have no Don't idea have a bank <laughs> yes uh, no, no, i have a question uh, please okay oh. jaime yes also 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 oh, is me. very uh experienced sandwich problem author okay uh well um uh, besides sandwiches uh, another class of problems that you have introduced and that has been very successful is on the intersectional graphs of paths in a grid, in grids, EPG and BPG graphs. Now, uh, are there any results on sandwich problems on uh, EPG or and or BPG graphs? Do you know of um, any problems or results? Uh, the short answer is no, I don't know of any results on sandwich for EPT or VPT. Um, but uh, the, the one thing is that if recognition is hard, yes, okay. sandwich is harder. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so you would only be looking at those cases, uh, those special cases of EPG or yes. EPT that are tractable. Yeah. And then is there are good question, might be good questions to-, to uh, There are a few, for, for yeah. instance, involving trees. Right, exactly, various tree, right. And so I suppose that there are results that are maybe not framed within this, the sandwich world, but are equivalent to it and probably many open questions. Okay. Other questions? Annegret, do you have anything to say about uh, sandwiches? Um, about the sandwiches? Mm, yes and no. Um, so I studied similar things with respect to perfectness. Um, 
So there I studied elusiveness, but it is a similar problem um, where you kind of start to fill in the adjacency matrix of the graph and you want to know whether uh, you can surely reach at the perfect graph without filling the whole matrix or whether you really have to go to the very end. So that was an interesting thing. But I would like to come back to Jamie's question in fact, because um, uh, you know, Marty, I work on the routing and spectrum assignment problem and their edge intersection graphs of the routing class play a crucial role. And in fact, um, I would be interested in whether we could do something uh, to guarantee that whichever routing one uses for one instance, certain edges or conflicts between routing paths have always to be present and certain have never to be present. And how to choose uh, the other ones, that means the intersection of the routing path to guarantee some properties. So uh, I would be highly interested in this question. And, and if everybody else uh, has an idea what to do or finds this problem interesting, please contact me and tell me. So this, this is a question that extremely is of extremely large interest for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK, thank you. Okay, anyone else have uh, questions before we uh, say goodbye? Uh, considering you open problems, you mentioned that tolerance graphs, uh, it's not known the complexity for tolerance graphs. Are there any other uh, graph classes that you'd, you'd point as open for sandwich? Um, well, Jaime just asked about the various subclasses of EPT or EPG that I suppose those would be open questions. And I guess that uh, also we could probably think of 2000 to 2020 graph classes that haven't been solved. <laughs> so uh, the, the challenge will be to find what's interesting and what's not interesting. But I must say that uh, when I saw Simone's paper uh, that I cited here, uh, I was intrigued to see, you know, how really uh, you could take many, many different uh, classes and try to figure out a whole buffet of, uh, of, of possibilities. May I try to share again, Marty? Say that again? May I try to share again? Okay, let me just... Uh... Okay, you should be able to now. Ah, oh, there we go. Yes, this is the paper. Okay, so what are we seeing here? Yes, um, this, this figure uh, summarizes the results and, and the, the classes that, that we have, we don't have the header here. Uh -huh. So, so they are the open problems. So as you can see, there are uh, many problems without uh, classification. I mean, one, so I would two, like to know three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. Yeah. So I would like to know whether we could have a manufacturer uh, create these dominoes and yeah. then have a game that we could play using these kinds yeah. of dominoes, which are quite different than, yes, you know, instead of nice. just four dots, it's four dots with edges and different shapes. And you have to match them in different ways. I think that would be a lot of fun. Let's have yes. a, an entrepreneur who would uh, be yes. interested in creating this domino game. Yes. So, thank you. Okay. Um, so now, okay. Very good. Uh, yeah, I finished the, the 
the think yes okay okay so sorry uh, i have that okay very good so i would like to thank everybody for being on today and uh look forward to next week uh rogers will be giving a talk next week and uh and again uh, i'm looking for uh, people who would like to give talks that second half of uh, November and the second half of December. So, so uh, if you're waving to me, then yes. se send me an email and, uh, and it'll be great to, uh, to uh, schedule uh, additional talks. So thanks very much, everybody. And uh, we'll 